Hello, everybody, on behalf of the uh, Chicago Booth Alumni Club of Greater New York City. Uh, thanks very much for joining this evening. Uh, we're happy to do this virtual panel at a, at a cru crucial time, and I think we've got a very uh, worthwhile topic to discuss. I'm very happy to introduce uh, our moderator for tonight on behalf of the Alumni Club. We've got with us Dr. Tamir al Dad, who is a uh, leader in healthcare innovation, uh, medicine, and biomedical research. Uh, he is also the founder and CEO of Mindful Urgent Care. And I think his topics today will be quite timely in view of not only the uh, opportunities for innovation, but the challenges that we are all confronting in the midst of uh, COVID-19. With that, I am very happy and pleased to turn it over to uh, Tamir. Thanks very much. Thank you, Brian, for the uh, warm introduction. I am your moderator this evening, Tamir Aldad, and welcome to the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of New York Healthcare webinar, where we're going to be discussing changes to healthcare delivery and innovation post COVID 19. I'm joined this evening by several dear friends and colleagues, including Chet Robson, Chief Clinical Officer and Medical Director of Walgreens, Cara McNulty, President of Behavioral Health at Aetna, Hank Chaudhry, CEO of the Federation of State Medical Boards. Neil Leibowitz, Chief Medical Officer at Talkspace, and Brendan Green, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at One Medical. Unfortunately, Carolyn White, the CEO of TIA Women's Health, had an emergency and is unable to join us this evening. Before we get started, I would like to thank several people and get that out of the way, including the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, uh, the Alumni Relations Department, the Alumni Club of New York, specifically, uh, Susie david Khanian, Brian Egger, Denise Dilley, and of course our panelists for their hard work. Some housekeeping to set expectations. There will be five people speaking today. You will hear my voice as the moderator and our guests. All participants will be muted. We would like you to participate by asking questions, so please type questions in the Q&A box at any time during the webinar. Our presentation will last 60 minutes today and our panelists will speak for 40 of those minutes, and then we will have 20 minutes for questions. Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be available in a couple of days. So let's begin. I would like to ask our panelists to please turn on their videos and unmute themselves. All right. So each panelist will answer two of the following questions along with an introduction of who they are and the organization they represent. Chet, we will start with you. Please introduce yourself and share with us, how did COVID-19 affect your organization and what did you guys do to pivot? Hi, Tamir, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So yes, I'm the chief clinical officer for the Walgreens Corporation. I've been there about five and a half years and have the opportunity to work across a broad spectrum of, of different um, uh, business uh, uh, projects. Um, you know, for us, uh, pharmacy is an essential business. So we didn't have the ability to close or to even slow down. Um, so what it meant was, of course, very quickly, we had to figure out how best to protect our customers and our employees, the PPE and plexiglass and social distancing and all the things that we've all become so used to the last few months. Um, we had to figure out better ways to deliver medications and products with home delivery and curbside and drive-through, and especially, of course, um, digital and online. Um, we had to learn how to better deliver services through telemedicine, through pharmacy chat, so people could, could talk to both a doctor and to a pharmacist easily. It gave us some opportunity to do some professional growth and diversity. Um, we moved more into the lab testing area. Um, the HHS has provided us provider status so that our pharmacists can order some tests. And of course, for all of us, we've become much more um, involved with public health. Um, uh, and, and of course, the, the other thing is we've also had to learn some um, uh, retail protections and education. We had to create some drug limits for certain medications um, that had runs on them, hydrochloroquine, nicotine replacement. We had to do some education about um, lots of home remedies for hand sanitizers. Um, so it's been a it's a very been a very interesting taste a time and and uh, a really good opportunity to to serve our customers in a different way. 
Yeah, absolutely. We had the same thing uh, at Mindful where we had to pivot quickly and make sure we ensure the same access to care, if not greater because of the demand. So um, I, I definitely can understand where you're coming from. Cara, I'd love to hear from you a little bit as to, um, in addition to introducing yourself, how you guys were affected and what you did to pivot. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Cara McNulty. I oversee the Behavioral Health and Resources for Living, which is our EAP initiative for Aetna and CVS Health. And we serve a broad variety of individuals and plan sponsors and people across, across the country and beyond. And very similar to Dr. Robson, you know, the COVID-19 has given us a total pivot in how you operate a business and how do you continually keep the health and well-being of whether it's your employees or the consumers and guests you serve or the communities safe. And I think we can all appreciate that. Um, I mean, I'm a population health scientist. This is what I do for a living. And everything is changing rapidly. And so then you overlay that with people's mental health well-being. We've all had to pivot a lot. So we've done very similar things to Dr. Robson, you know, really looked at how do we serve our guests in our stores and our customers to the best of our ability that keeps them safe, that keeps our employees safe. How do we make sure we are providing access to care that reduces barriers? And so if you think about just you know, whether that's um, deliver delivering pharmaceuticals or moving your providers who maybe some of them have been used to telemedicine and televideo or in mental health, a lot of providers didn't utilize telemedicine or televideo. So helping them get up to speed and on platforms that are safe and protective and how to utilize that technology. So really, looking at those access issues, and then also thinking about our own employees and what it means for them to either transition home. Um, so I, on my team, I have a thousand people. We transitioned people home to what about their own health well-being? And then last, I would say we have stayed really focused on um, how we engage engage with our company, engage with our customers, engage with our plan sponsors, because as we've all seen, social distancing is one piece, but social isolation is another. And how, how do we continue to evolve as a community to address the fear, the unknown? So I love that we're doing this panel together and that, um, you know, you may hear a dog barking, let's be clear, you may hear kids, but we're all learning to adjust. And so we as a business have had to take a pause and say, okay, what's best for everyone from our employees to our customers, to our communities. And um, I would say there's been a lot of things that have been really hard, but there's been a lot of growth and ability to show up for people in need. And I'm really proud of the work that CVS Health Aetna has accomplished. No, absolutely. Something that you say that's really nice is um, the balance between social isolation and social distancing, right? It's like a, the seesaw can't tip more one way than, than <laughs> the other because of the consequences, right? And, and right. There's, um, there's a balancing act that, that goes on there. And, you know, I appreciate your answer and kind of bringing that perspective. And I'm, I'm curious, Hank, to hear from you from the perspective of, of the physician and the regulatory bodies that, that go behind the scenes. Um, as a provider, you're also, there's a tug of war there between worrying about yourself and your own family, but then, you know, staying true to the oath that you took of being there for others. Um, and, and there's a dissonance there as well. So I'd be curious to hear from you how you guys, um, had to respond and pivot and handle uh, COVID-19. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tom Aaron. Thank you to the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of New York for having us. Um, Kara used the term social distancing and you did as well. Uh, I like to use the term physical distancing because we still need to be socially connected as we are right now. 
uh, in many ways, I think many of your audience will agree in some ways we're more connected, um, but clearly that physical uh, distance is still there. Um, I'm Dr. Uh, Hank Chowdhury. Uh, for the last 10 years, I have been the president and CEO of the Federation of State Medical Boards. This is the uh, national organization that's the umbrella organization for the nation's state medical boards that license physicians, PAs, and other healthcare practitioners. So on this call, you'll hear about healthcare providers and the delivery of care. I'm not involved directly in the delivery of care, uh, but uh, without the licensing and without the physicians and other healthcare providers, uh, obviously, um, you know, they're all connected. And so, um, and I grew up in New York, by the way, I should probably mention, went to NYU, NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine, trained in internal medicine at NYU Winthrop Hospital on Long Island. As far as the pivot for our organization, I had a background in public health, Tamir, as you know. I was the uh, health commissioner in Suffolk County during our last pandemic, 11 years ago with H1N1. So I had a little bit of an idea of uh, sort of what could happen since we had studied what could happen and prepared for pandemics. Uh, but obviously this is very different than the H1N1 influenza pandemic. Um, I had a master's degree in health in uh, uh, healthcare management from the Harvard School of Public Health. So in my role at the FSMB, uh, I got everyone to pay attention a little bit sooner perhaps than others did. So we put together a task force. Look, we actually called it the Pandemic Preparedness Task Force because it was put together in February before the pandemic was declared. And we started preparing. And we started preparing by having conversations with the state licensing boards, uh, recognizing that this could get worse. And by the time it was declared a pandemic in March, um, as you know, many of the, actually all of the states and territories declared uh, an emergency. That enabled them to be flexible with their licensing laws, for example. And so, physicians and other providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, were suddenly able to practice medicine across state lines in most cases, um, whether in person or with telemedicine. And uh, that was important. The FSMB, my organization, provided guidance. We were in close touch with the uh, White House Coronavirus Task Force. My contact was Dr. Burks, although I've met Dr. Fauci before, uh, but uh, we also were in touch with HHS um, and other branches of uh, government who were trying to do the right thing. And we were certainly involved in New York as well, helping Governor Cuomo and his outstanding leadership uh, during the crisis uh, when New York was the epicenter of the world for the um, pandemic and making sure when they put out a call for volunteers to help, uh, we were helping out in the back back end to make sure that those who did uh, help end up helping were qualified to do so. Um, and so that's a brief summary. No, it's, uh, it's true. And you guys did, did very good work to, um, you know, pivot and respond as fast as possible, which was, which was really important. So, you know, hearing from the organizations that were behind the scenes, you know, a bunch of us were also in the front lines and, um, Neil and Brendan kind of representing organizations that have the most face-to-face -face interaction um, with, with patients going through all this. Neil, I, I'd love to hear from you as well, kind of how, how did you guys react when uh, COVID-19 became as um, challenging as it did and what did you guys have to do to respond? Before, thank you, Tamir, and thank you, uh, University of Chicago. Before I introduce myself and answer your question, I'm going to compliment Hank for his organization. We watched as the different organizations that we were tracking 50 states, various licensures. The medical boards were really progressive and prepared. While I felt that several of the other boards in the therapy arena are fragmented and their response made our lives a lot more challenging. I have this unwieldy 50 state grid that I tracked even pre-COVID and with COVID it added many elements. The medical side has been a lot easier, and, and I think some of the preparedness paid off, and we've struggled with other areas. So I'm Dr. Neil Leibowitz. I'm a psychiatrist by training. I'm the chief medical officer at Talkspace. I've been for about two and a half years at this point. Prior to that, I was with Optum as part of United Healthcare. Uh, what we saw in digital health really, for us, 2018 was the year everyone adopted digital health and that came and went. 2019 was really the year where digital health adoption hit that steep part of the curve and it came and went. And then 2020 came 
And we were seeing adoption. We've seen growth, we've seen utilization, we've entered into contracts with insurers and businesses. Um, I think it was 2019, we thought, okay, the adoption is gonna be great. Um, Optum became a client and Primera, which is a large blues out West. And adoption came, but really not in the way we expected it. And I would probably say that for many in the digital health ecosystem. And the pandemic hit, and it's very conflicting in a way, because you don't want to do well off the backs of all this pain and suffering. But on the other hand, it's an opportunity to be there for people, to offer them something that they need in a way that we were really prepared for. Prior to February, we were not accepting providers, so new therapists in 33 out of 50 states. Now we're taking providers in 50 out of 50 states. So what we did was we flipped the supply and demand equation where we were really looking for demand. And the demand came in really a crushing way is people, A, the need. So from an anxiety standpoint, we track outcomes. We've seen a full deviation increase in the level of anxiety that people are coming in from. So all of a sudden we're flush with people needing help. And now we beta tested whether all the tools we created to scale and everyone talks about startups and scaling were in place to be successful. And we've seen some success in definitely being able to match people to provide therapy, to provide psychiatry. That said, our customer service, like many other companies in the digital world, have been slammed. And if any of you have reached out for customer support during the pandemic and gotten that reply, it may take longer than usual. Well, it took us longer than usual. We hired five customer service people. For a company of about 100 people, that's a lot of people that we had to hire because we were behind. So as prepared as we were, or we'd like to think we were, there is still, you see where your cracks are and it becomes a beta test in your ability to respond. Even for what I would call a small and nimble and really that adaptation, I would say now we're in a much better place than we probably were in April as we were really just scrambling with a remote workforce as Chad and Kara had spoken to and getting used to what that new normal is. But you know, as we're sort of really stabilizing as an organization and we feel like we've met that onslaught, you know, digital health, I think we'll talk about this in a few moments, is here to stay and how it evolves will be really interesting. No, absolutely. And I, I could tell you that at Mindful, same thing. We saw a huge influx in demand. Um, it's a blessing for many people, but if it comes too fast, it's a little, you know, you really have to react. But the issue there is, um, you know, since we're in network, it's credentialing providers is the rate limiting step kind of for us, right? That's the bottleneck. How fast can we get providers ready? Even if they're ready, willing, and able, how fast can they actually see a patient? Um, so many pieces have to fall in the right place for that to happen, that things happen really fast. And to this day, we're, we're, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve, but it, it is definitely challenging because of all that demand that um, that was a reaction to COVID and, and uh, people's anxieties and, and mental health became um, something that other people might have neglected and now suddenly came to the forefront of the conversation. So I, I totally um, agree with you, Neil. Brendan, if you can shine some light on the primary care scene um, and how things looked for you guys and, and how you had to handle it and respond. Sure, Tamara, and thank you again so much for letting me join this, this great panel and discussion. One Medical is a national technology-enabled primary care services organization. We deliver great top-of-license care next to where people live and work and shop. We want to make it as convenient as possible for them to see us. The beauty of our model is that when COVID hit, we had the technology and infrastructure to allow us to serve people digitally. We didn't need to scramble to bolt on a service. We actually have 24 seven virtual medical teams as part of our offering already. We have a very, very large patient base that we're used to seeing us through the app as well as in person. So we had that infrastructure and, and base ready to go to, to meet the pandemic. So we've really been able to really quickly pivot, as Neil said, to figuring out how we can serve more people. How can we get out beyond our current base 
and help with the need, particularly around testing. So starting in Seattle in early March, where we put up our first outdoor tent, we become one of the largest outdoor testers, COVID testers in the country. Uh, we've done a partnership with the mayor's office in the city of New York that uh, many of you might have seen where we have tents uh, throughout the five boroughs. A uh, partnership with the city of San Francisco where we have an outdoor tent. And we also have outdoor testing in all of our 12 markets across the country. So we've really been able to get out there and get people tested. We've also offered without charge access to our virtual coverage and to testing regardless of someone's coverage, whether or not they have healthcare coverage, we're giving them a path to get in and get tested and get care. And finally, we're able to lean into our employer partners to help them figure out how to get their employees or for universities, how to get their students back on campus. So through our Healthy Together program, we're putting up programs that are gonna allow these universities and employers to safely test and plan for folks coming back. Great. No, thank you for that. And, and really the work uh, all of you guys do, which has to really happen kind of harmoniously, um, help shape what has been a strong response by the medical community to, to COVID and caring for as many patients as possible as they're going through this. So thank you guys for all of that and, and for your insight. Um, so we discussed a little bit about the, the past and, and how you pivoted. Uh, I'd be curious to hear from each of you how you predict health, the healthcare space will change moving forward, um, both at your organization and if you have any predictions overall how the space will change. I think a lot of our participants are curious to hear your insight. Uh, and we can go in the same order we went uh, first, uh, Chet, if you would like to kind of offer some uh, insight, that'd be great. Sure. Oh. So I, I, I think there's some kind of obvious things that we'll, we'll kind of probably all talk about. And I think perhaps there's a couple of unique things, obviously virtual services, telemedicine, telepharmacy, um, digital opportunities um, will, will all become, you know, they've already become much more prevalent and they will continue in, in various uh, uh, frameworks. Um, and obviously there's gonna to continue to be a huge emphasis on testing and that's only gonna grow as we get into the fall and, and schools open back up and businesses open back up. Testing is going to be, you know, a really big concern. And then especially as we work, look towards winter, when you begin to overlap the, the COVID testing with influenza testing, with pneumonia, with a number of other respiratory conditions, um, the complexity of that is something that I think all of us are beginning to prepare for and to think about how we're gonna to respond to that. Certainly vaccines, um, you know, being in the pharmacy business that uh, dispenses vaccines on a very um, broad basis, beginning to think about um, how we'll be able to help to, to make that happen, how we'll be able to help to dispense those, um, you know, working closely with the government uh, and payers of thinking about how, how that's going to happen. Um, uh, I, I think we're already beginning to see um, one of the, the fragments we've seen happen here is that governments um, at every different level have a challenge working with this kind of thing. So companies are beginning to need to step up and take leadership in a lot of different ways. And I think we'll, we'll continue to see that um, uh, throughout the next year or two. Um, and of course, I'm really glad for the panelists that we have on here because without question, mental health needs as people are dealing with the disease, if they're dealing with the isolation as they're dealing with financial issues, so many aspects um, and, and that's only gonna continue. So definitely looking at all the different ways all of us can work together to meet um, mental health needs. And then the last one that I'd say that, that um, I know that we've begun to really address, um, which was a, a very big challenge before this ever began. But again, you know, the, the pandemic has really laid it open and, and bare is all the health inequities of thinking about how do we better serve um, um, populations in so many different settings? How do we help them um, with not only their chronic needs, obviously with their COVID needs um, and, and how do we deliver, deliver, you know, new delivery models that that's going to help that because that, that's something that, you know, I think a number of us have been working at, struggling at for a long time, but it's really be, been driven to the forefront through this. 
Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a, there's a fear that uh, things will become polarized instead of more equitable, right? And you got to you got to be careful on on what we do to to make sure that um, we continue pushing everyone forward and, and constantly moving the needle towards a better delivery system. So that's definitely it on everyone's mind. And it'll be interesting to see how retail pharmacy changes moving forward. Um, hard hard to tell, but um, it, I think everyone's going to be returning to a new normal. Um, Cara, how about uh, for you guys? What do you guys see as the future? Yeah, I mean, similar, it's it's lovely to follow Chet. I can just literally say ditto. Um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll start at the back end of his comments. You know, I think what we see, and I'm thrilled to see this as we deal with, you know, a, a viral pandemic and also a racial pandemic or racial unrest is that businesses, and look at, it's gonna take all of us, that's the other thing on this panel, we need all these companies to work towards a solution. And you have a couple of companies here that we all do testing and we need it, we need it. And vaccine delivery and you know mental health. But if we just start with business and social impact, we need, we need all of these companies and all of us to be making that connection between how do our businesses that do well impact social and the social connection of our communities. And so one of the things I think that will change or even grow more than it has is the importance of social impact and businesses involvement in social impact. And then if you back in even farther, I mean, we all want people to have access to care and COVID and numerous things have made it really clear that democratizing access to care is vital. And so how do we remove barriers so that whether you're insured or you're underinsured or you have no insurance that you get the support you need how do we meet you along your healthcare journey? And I will say not separating your mental, your physical, your emotional, your social health, treating you as one. And then how do we do that in a way that drives innovation through the modalities that meet people where they're at? And we'll just continue. I mean, we talk about a lot that there is a huge influx of investment in the, from VCs into mental health. And what I have to say is, yes, we need it. We need it. We need companies like Talkspace helping us democratize access. We need, we need all of us. So we'll look at different ways of modality and how we engage people and how we may be physically distanced, but how do we continue that engagement to not be isolated? So I do think we'll see innovation. And, you know, the last thing I think, I would say that we are seeing is um, maybe, and I'll talk from just our company, looking at how might we do things different because it's time. And in healthcare, we often have done things the same way because it's how the system is built. And, and listen, COVID helped break some things for us. So how can we use this time as a reset to say, okay, gosh, are we setting up the system accurately and what would make it better for the end user? So I'm, I'm really hopeful that social impact, that innovation, that new forms and modalities of care, democratizing access to care, and maybe rethinking some of our systems will be the, the outbirth of, of what's happening in today's world. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, there's, it's that, that struggle between being like reactive versus proactive about a solution, yeah. right? And that, that's something that even when, when you're, you're practicing medicine, you're talking about, you know, are, are you being preventative and, and giving prophylaxis? Or are you always being reactive and treating? And, and, and that, that tug of war and that struggle is something that applies to, to all of us moving forward. One thing though that you mentioned is um, a decrease in barriers and social impact. And one of the best things 
um, that has happened, you know, despite everything that's been so challenging, is everything that Hank's organization has done um, to decrease the, the, the uh, barriers to licensure um, and allow more people and more providers to practice across state lines with less limitations um, has had a, a really meaningful and significant social impact um, in terms of access to care. So, um, Hank, that, that kind of sets it up for you to talk a little bit about what you see is, is the future um, because I know a lot of providers are are, um, are are doing well with with the current structure, being able to to have less red tape when trying to get licensure and 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 help as many patients as possible. And there's a fear among providers in the hospital setting that they're going to return to the old normal, and um, all the good that has come out of of this might disappear. So wh where do you see um, licensure and regulations in the future? Well, Tomer, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but a lot of what we had done at the Federation of State Medical Boards with our member boards, we had actually started even before the pandemic. And so what we're seeing now is those efforts are being utilized and it's actually energizing us as an opportunity to do even more. One example is the uh, Interstate Medical Licensure Compact that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, that was put into place about three years ago uh, essentially, if you can imagine, and people talk about how every state is different, that's true, but we managed to get them all together in a room, and I'm summarizing here broadly, uh, 29 states and two territories over the last three years have signed the interstate compact into law and essentially agreed to nine criteria, that if a physician meets these nine criteria, uh, participating states and territories agree to issue a license instantly. And that's incredible. That's revolutionary. And that happened before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, we saw a greater utilization of that. In fact, New York was one of the states that wasn't sure if they wanted to become part of it. Well, there was just a hearing at the New York State Assembly about that law. So we hope that it'll get passed in New York and other places. It is uh, the law in Illinois and a number of other states. Uh, but that's one example. Um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty. About, I mean, 2020 has been I think everyone would agree a year of change. Um, and we don't know what the rest of the year will show. It still isn't over. Uh, we have an election coming up in a few months. We have 2021. We don't know what will happen next year or the year after. So we all have to prepare as best as we can to make sure that there is access to care available. And Kara is absolutely correct. I'm glad she mentioned uh, you know, social upheaval, the reawareness, if you will, of uh, systemic racism and a health inequity that's out there. Um, I noticed during the pandemic, a number of states expanded Medicaid uh, because they realized at the end of the day, they have to deliver care and they have to do it affordably at the state level to those who need it. I suspect sooner or later, there'll be more conversations about how can we make sure that uh, people are insured and are able to get the care that they need, whether it's primary, secondary, or tertiary, or preventive. I think all that's going to be part of this. Telemedicine is definitely here to stay. Um, my parents live in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, my mom's 82. My mom's, my dad's 85. My mom is very with it. And so she was using FaceTime, WhatsApp, and she was interacting with her doctors, taking her own blood pressure, and, uh, you know, engaging in that. But now that New York is no longer the epicenter, uh, it's still a concern, of course, but less so. Um, she's back to uh, scheduling appointments for in-person visits. So while we saw uh, utilization grow up, go up considerably by both providers of telehealth and by utilizers of telehealth of all ages, uh, some of that is coming down in parts where the pandemic is less of a concern, certainly not in the South. We may see higher utilization in the South. So what does that mean for the future? I think there will be greater use of telehealth and telemedicine. Um, I think the industry, and we've had good conversations with the American Telemedicine Association, is going to need to uh, do some research to show um, that, you know, not only is there greater utilization by volume, but that there are improved patient outcomes, that the benefits outweigh the harms. Because obviously at three o'clock in the morning on a Friday, if you develop chest pain, that's not the time to uh, charge up your laptop to use telehealth. That's the time to call 911 and get in-person care. Um, but uh, we've had uh, good conversations with those involved with telemedicine. I think um, 
if some of these temporary measures that the states have taken need to stay in place, states will need to be convinced that there's value. And of course, finally, the last comment is the uncertainty related to healthcare costs. Greater utilization, especially if it's a fee-for-service model for telehealth, will lead to greater healthcare costs. So healthcare already is a large part of the GDP at 18 to 19 percent. Um, you know, we would like the cost to go down. We, and when I say we, I mean I don't mean the state boards. I mean we as a nation uh, need those healthcare costs to go down efficiently while delivering quality care, and that's still an area that's ripe for discussion and policy intervention. Sorry, I was muted. Absolutely, you said it quite beautifully, and you, you hit on a lot of uh, on a lot of good points. I think everyone will agree that the age of uh, telehealth, telemedicine, um, and kind of the digital era in medicine will, will be changing. Neil, how do you see things changing um, beyond this? Telehealth has been up and coming, and it is obviously now everyone's uh, modality of choice. But moving forward, what do you predict? Early, at the beginning of this year, I caved and bought a pair of AirPods. And now I can't live without them. They changed my life. I'm not a consumer person, but somehow now they are in my pocket at all times and usually on. I think the same thing in terms of telehealth. It's going to be an expectation and not an add-on. People are going to expect it. And most people in the medical arena will have to provide it or else your practice really won't exist in the way it does from a patient volume and an expectations. So that's one. We've given this to some, well, we've let it out of the box. It's not coming back in. I think the same thing on the regulatory standpoint. We've pushed some of the regulatory limits. We haven't seen a lot of negative consequences. We do want to roll back some things, right? Perhaps we don't want to have telephonic be the modality of choice, we want people to do video, for example. We want to have some of more of the HIPAA of the protection and privacy roll back, but I think we want to figure out what the balance is and where we need to change some of the regulations. It hasn't made a lot of sense that I can, as a New York State licensed physician, in a bricks and mortar practice, see someone who lives in New Jersey, but I can't turn on the screen and see someone in New Jersey who may live five miles away. So we're going to need to figure out ethically and culturally what we want and what we don't. The third thing I think is, is we've pushed mental health as part of the conversation, which I'm really pleased at, that it's not just the physical toll, it's the mental toll. And I think the mental toll will go on for a long time as the economic pain goes on. Mental health tracks economics very closely, more so than it does pandemic. So I think having that in the conversation has been very, very valuable. And then Something, I don't know if it's a prediction or more of a hope, and it was touched on before, which is we've been solving for access in the last three to four months. And I don't want to undervalue that. But I think we haven't solved for quality yet, and we're going to need to build in more infrastructure to solve for quality. That may take some time. So it's been, let's get everyone on digital health and let's get them seeing patients and helping people. And I think that we should have done that, and that was the right move. But as time goes on, we're going to need to figure out, let's, how do we do that while preserving and increasing the quality? Without increasing the quality, we're not going to change costs. So to do all those things are sort of where I think we're going to move. How quickly, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But my hope is in the next year or two, that will move to the focus. For sure. I agree. But I, you know, I'll tell you, I think that, that it, it's um, very specialty specific in terms of how that could roll out. Um, you know, some specialties can adapt much faster um, and deliver much faster. Other specialties, I think, will lag behind. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see um, who can let go of the face-to-face -face visit um, first and who will let go of it last. Brendan, maybe you could uh, shine some light, at least from the primary care perspective, uh, what it will look like to to transition um, into what will be a very digital telehealth future. Sure, and what an interesting discussion. Uh, so obviously, Hank, we are huge believers in the, in the clinical efficacy of telemedicine and, and virtual health services. But to prove out quality and to really make it work from our perspective, it needs to be integrated with physical delivery of care. There are certainly some things where Patients and providers want to lay hands on the patient, and we will continue to offer that. I, I do think that the genie is really out of the bottle. I think folks that were on the fence about 
doing a video visit or making a phone call, I think that they've seen that that can work and they don't need to show up at the urgent care or the ER and they can just call us at three o'clock in the morning and be taken care of. So I think telemedicine, I think it's here, it's, it's out of the box as, as Neil has said, and I think we'll continue to see heavy utilization of it. And to Kara's great point about improving access, we see telemedicine as a way to expand care and expand people's ability to be cared for. So we're very bullish on uh, telemedicine as going forward, but we'll continue to operate bricks and mortar next to where you're working with. Great, thank, thank you guys for, for that insight. And I think you guys, your answers complement each other nicely, giving a, a good, well-rounded perspective. So I think uh, our participants definitely appreciate that. We will open, time flew, um, we will open to q and I do have some questions myself as well that I, I will throw out there. Um, we already have five Q&A questions um, to get to. Uh, so I will ask you them, feel free if, if the question resonates with you and you have an answer at the tip of your tongue, go for it um, and we'll take it from there. So the first question is, given the disruption of supply chains across the world due to restricted travel, how are health providers adapting their delivery of care in light of the limited availability of medical supplies? So do any of you feel like you can kind of uh, speak to the fact that, that uh, supplies are limited due to restricted travel? And um, I guess, do we see that changing moving forward? And how are we adapting to that in terms of um, access to supplies, access to medications, things like that? I could answer from a, our primary care perspective. You know, we've been able to secure PPE um, and all of the, the necessary safeguards in order to operate physically safety for our patients and, and for our colleagues. So at least from the primary care perspective, um, clearly a little bumpy for the entire world at the beginning, but uh, we think we've mapped out that, that PPE issue. Have any of you guys encountered um, obstacles because of limited supply and had to strategize around that? I can say that we, especially early on, we definitely did, partly just because of the size of our organization. So to suddenly come up with 270,000 face masks to put on people um, every day, you know, um, it, it was it's a pretty big challenge, especially when every other healthcare provider in the country is and in the world is, is trying to do. So um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I don't have any great solutions for, you know, we were talking about quality of, of delivery of services. I think also, you know, quality of, of sometimes of the PPE and quality of the supplies you get can, can be a bit of a problem. I guess one of the things that I've been um, alternately pleased about, though, is the, the supply of medication. So we've not really seen um, a tremendous um, interruption of medications. We've seen runs on a few particular medications, but overall um, the world supply, the national supply of medication has been able to be maintained and to be maintained safely. And I think that's, that's a really important point. You know, as a society, we've come so used to be of medications being a staple of how treatment happens. Um, and being able to maintain that and not have black markets suddenly exist, I think really has been one of the successes um, that we could point to through this. Gosh, I, I completely agree. And we have monitored medications. And even when we've seen news reports that, you know, there's a short supply of Zoloft or we have monitored and been able to maintain the supply, which is really important. And I think we should all feel really good about that. It's, it's such a great point. You know, one of the things that we have done as an organization is from the start and, you know, we talked about population health and prevention and intervention. And we opened up a, um, we liberalized our resources for living line to anyone, whether you had an insurance or not across the country. And if you were dealing, if you were in need of, you know, help for a mental health issue, 
or you know a broader behavioral health issue or a social determinant determinant of health issue we liberalize this line and what's interesting is you know at the same time that we're hearing about PPE and and we didn't have enough masks for all of our people as well what you had on the flip side is people who are calling to say I'm worried that I'm going to lose my job or I'm an essential worker in retail and I'm nervous and where do I get toilet paper <laughs> and what about you know where's the local food banks and there's a short supply of chicken and that's what we can afford and I think it's just so interesting and I'm grateful we're able to help people and figure that out but you know as as we in healthcare are, are worried about PPE and, and it's the right thing and, and quality you have people who are saying how do I get toilet paper and hey where I'm losing my job so it's that reality check of um, supply and demand and how do we again focus on a systematic approach and get people the right resources at the right time when they need it and Neil I'll say I agree with you it's it's broader than access it's access to quality care it you know we have to have that cost quality access as the trifecta while meeting people's social determinants so and Tommy if I could I'll make one other comment uh, you ask a good question and I suspect there are many people in the audience who are more familiar with global supply chains but it is for our nation a vulnerability above and beyond healthcare. And if you look at the way we are connected to the world, whether we like it or not, uh, that means that uh, for the future, the uncertainty that I spoke of, uh, it's important that we have uh, good working relationships with much of the world. Um, and so that we can't just do it alone. It's just not possible. Uh, we have challenges with a number of countries and world powers. Uh, everyone does. We need to sort them out as best we can, but we need to figure out a way to uh, collaborate and coordinate uh, because uh, our vulnerability may be somebody else's vulnerability tomorrow and the other way around as well. We are too interconnected in this day and age to try to do it all by ourselves. Absolutely, no, and, and hopefully this will push us in, in that direction to, to work uh, for as a team with everyone involved. We have another question from our, our uh, participant asking if, uh, do you guys think COVID-19 will accelerate the move towards a one payer system? Anyone have thoughts I, on a one payer I, 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 our, I could, our friends at Aetna and Walgreens would have to say about <laughs> that first. <laughs> my my <laughs> eyes are on them, but you can't really tell where I'm looking. <laughs> I, I can speak to it a little bit because because we're a global company. So we have pharmacies in 25 countries. Um, and so we went through um, several, well, almost all of the countries, except the United States, it's a one payer system. Um, um, I, there, I, for dealing with something like this, there were some of the countries that did it a, a bit better, um, um, but many of them had exactly the same kinds of struggles um, perhaps in slightly different ways, but that, that we have, at least as far as a, a health system. Um, I don't really see this pushing us more towards a one-payer system, but what I do see is um, in the United States, um, and, and Kara alluded to this, and I think it will continue, is every company, every insurance company has found ways to open their doors and provide broader opportunities and, and be more inclusive of what we're doing. I see that happening much more. I mean, we, we will also continue to compete and so forth, but I think there will be a, a much better spirit of cooperation, but I don't necessarily see us moving um, that much more towards a one payer system. I completely agree. I, I think that um, we as humans would would like there to be one simple answer. And especially in uncertain times, and um, I don't, maybe I'll be proven wrong, I don't know that having a one payer system is going to provide all the change and innovation and really um, advancement that we need. And so 
it's how do we work collectively? How do we continue to provide quality care, access, address people holistically? But I, I don't think it will move us to a one payer system. I do hope it moves us to improving outcomes, keeping people at the center of this equation, looking at how we deliver care differently um, and where, where all of us can make improvements. Cause it's, again, it's going to take all of us and it's going to take industry innovation to, to improve. Absolutely. We have uh, time for one more question. Uh, and the question is asking, how have your companies been able to manage providing quality care to non COVID related needs? such as cancer prevention and treatment throughout this pandemic? Um, let me start, Tamir, for uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is partnering with groups like the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, we're part of an action collaborative looking, one of them is looking at clinician wellness. You know, we forget about clinicians uh, as we talk about access to care and people who need it. Uh, physicians and healthcare providers and nurse practitioners and nurses are people too, and uh, hundreds have died as well, uh, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, so we need to be mindful of their mental state and their healthcare needs. Uh, they are truly our heroes on the front lines. Uh, but also another action collaborative we're involved with is related to the opioid epidemic. Uh, just because we have a pandemic doesn't mean the opioid epidemic has gone away. Uh, we And you know, you mentioned other conditions, heart disease, cancer, they haven't gone away either. In fact, there's some troubling uh, numbers in epidemiology that uh, people may be suffering and dying more from that because they're afraid to go to a hospital or go get care that they need for those kinds of conditions. Uh, but uh, uh, that's where uh, trying to figure out new ways of delivering care uh, for those patients is going to be critical. Telehealth will play a role. The opioid epidemic, we just had a conversation this morning of the Action Collaborative talking about um, medication-assisted treatment and how that could be facilitated using telehealth models. Uh, so there's any number of conditions that are still out there. They're not going away. They still have to be managed. They still have to be treated. And I think we're going to all have to be innovative to deliver that care. And I would add, if I could, we are very much open for business for non-COVID care as well. So we believed from the beginning and continue to believe that you have to have access to primary care for preventative reasons, for management of care. Just a statistic for everyone to think about, every dollar you spend on primary care, you spend, you save $13 downstream on specialty care and hospital care. So. We think that that prevention and giving access to that prevention is key. So we're also doing a lot of outreach to our patient base saying, don't neglect your physical, don't neglect getting your blood sugars tested. We're going through to make sure that everyone is current on their testing and encouraging them to come into a, to a safe practice. Absolutely, no, and um, you, you guys bring up a good point, especially with the opioid epidemic and, and access to care there. I mean, people still need inductions for Suboxone, people still need access to their methadone, people still need infusion centers, right? All those, all those things, um, it, it's a great question that, that there's a fear that people think that there's a, um, some sort of, of uh, favoritism or um, preferential treatment uh, because of COVID, when we're really trying to um, have a social impact and you know be as um, as supportive of everyone at the same time, so definitely and staying mindful of that. Um, did anyone else want to answer that question? That's actually our, our uh, last question. But did anyone else want to address it? You know, I'll just put in a plug um, for you know Hank. You brought up a great point that. Our providers who are frontline, no matter who they're serving, need support. And there's a great organization called Given Hour, and we did a partnership with Given Hour, but others of you I know have um, engaged with Given Hour, and Given Hour provides free anonymous mental health counseling and service for our mental or for our. Um, healthcare providers, doesn't matter if you're an assistant, a nurse practitioner, a physician, a surgeon, it's at givenhour.com. It's a fantastic organization and important that we are taking care 
of those providers as they take care of our community. So thank you, Hank, for bringing that up. Um, and I know there's plenty of other organizations that provide support, but really in this time, we have to um, band together to support those providers delivering care. Absolutely, and self-care of those providers is, is very important. Um, well, I would first like to thank uh, our panelists for taking the time to, to join me this evening. Uh, Chet, Cara, Hank, Neil, uh, and Brendan, thank you very, very much. I know you guys are very busy, so I'm grateful. I wanted to let our participants know that um, we will be having a 30-minute networking session that we want to pilot after this. I'll let Brian share with you a little bit more about uh, how that works. But again, thank you very much for all those uh, participants who attended um, and to our panelists who took time to chat with me today. I'm, I'm grateful and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tamir. Thanks thank very you. much, Tamir.